So I would like to start off with uh, kind of a little illustration. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the website awkwardfamilyphotos.com, but uh, there's hours of fun on there, and I just brought a couple of photos today to, to give you an idea of some very awkward and crazy families. So uh, if you look at some of these photos, you can see, okay, families just got a little bit of weird in them sometimes. We've got a few different photos. They're like, what's up? Come on. I mean, what's up with this? What kind of a weird family would this have to be? Uh, I love this. Actually, Brooke, I think we should do this for Christmas. I love this. I love this look right here. Like the total, I don't know what this haircut is, kind of a mullet, whatever that thing is. The whole family's got it. Uh, I didn't notice what was going on until I saw the hedgehog here. Uh, I was like, just all kinds of awkward in this family here. This is just one of those moments that like you happen to catch and it's just real life. <laughs> you just happen to be throwing up on you while you're trying to take family photos. Uh, then you've got straight up crazy sometimes. Uh, you've got the family that doesn't want to be a part of the family, you know. Uh, and then I love this because there's always something that happens in, in these moments and you're like, oh, well, we just, we lost another one. How many of you have had like moments like that where you're a kid and you're just like, hey, it's whatever, we've lost, we've lost another one. Uh, and this is actually my family. Now, uh, this is me whenever I was growing up. This is a vacation years and years ago, but I, I distinctly remember my mom used to like, she used to uh, make our clothes sometimes, but we all happened to be wearing the same exact shirt that, that day on this vacation. And I remember for whatever reason rebelling and saying, I am not wearing the same clothes as everybody else. And uh, the rest of our family is not even in this. Obviously, someone was taking a photo, but I just had this, this idea. I'm not going to dress like the rest of the family. Didn't want to be a part of this crazy looking family, which was actually an incredibly godly family. I just didn't want to look like everybody else. So, Mom, sorry about that. My mom's here today, but we can dress like any day now. I don't care. I totally lost all that. So, so we're going to look at your, your crazy family today. And, and the truth is, sometimes you've got some crazy in your family and you don't even realize it. You need somebody else to point it out or we need to look at Scripture and have God reveal some things to us that we can say, you know what, maybe this isn't God's idea of what our family should look like. Maybe this, maybe what we're doing, maybe the way that we're living, maybe the way that our family is structured is not exactly healthy. So I'm going to use the word healthy a lot today to kind of illustrate what God's view of our family should look like. Um, and the truth is, healthy is not automatic. You don't just get there if you go to church and let the kids do their thing. But a healthy family takes a lot of work. It's, it's tough work to make your, to get your family in a place where there is fruit and there is health there. Um, if, if you look at culture, there's all kinds of ideas of what um, a healthy or the ideal, the ideal family would be. In China, for years, there was the one child rule. And um, their ideal family was you only have one kid where too many, too many people in China and recently the population has kind of leveled out and they've increased that law. They allow you to have two kids now and they'll penalize you and they've always penalized for years by taking your health care away or, or fines and different things like that if you have more kids. So China had this ideal family in mind and here in the States there's an organization known as Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood's ideal family would be one that's not inconvenient for you. You do something stupid on a weekend or something um, unfortunate happens to you, we can take care of that problem that you're going to have. And there's all throughout culture, you see culture trying to tell us what our family should look like, that there's this ideal family that you hear about in culture. But I want to, I mean, what is really culturally, what is an ideal family? Maybe you grew up thinking something different. Maybe you grew up thinking um, you're on your first marriage and that's ideal. You have two and a half kids and a dog, no cats. That would be ideal. Maybe you're educated or you're wealthy. That would be the ideal family. I think all these things, though, they have a tendency to be very surface level. And God doesn't care about surface things, but God looks at what? God looks at our heart. And he has a purpose for every one of our families. And I want us to just look today. Let's look past all the surface things that we assume this is an ideal family. Let's look past all that and say, God, what is it that would be the family that is on your heart that you are burning to see? What is the family that you would love to see me be a part of, for me to, 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 to foster and to, to encourage, to grow? What, what kind of a family is it that you care about. So I want to look at today, actually, it's kind of an equation for me. I want to look at whenever God gives Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus 4, you see kind of one of the, one of the first commandments. He gives, us this, he gives us this commandment, and it's basically uh, a math problem. 
It is subtraction of the idols in our life. I think that is a really good explanation, and it has something to do with our families as well. But I think that we need to learn today, and this is what we're going to talk about, subtracting the idols from our life. In, in verse 4, I'm sorry, this is Exodus 20, verse 4. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them and worship them for a for I, the Lord, your God, am jealous God who will not tolerate affection for any other gods. So here's this commandment, no other gods before me, no idols before me. But then he says this, he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Now, I think it's very interesting as I'm reading this that there's a commandment that talks about taking the idols out of our lives, but then he di directly relates our families to that. And he says, he says these two things are related. I believe that a healthy family, number one, the first thing that a healthy family is built on is a healthy family is an idol-free family. A healthy family is an idol-free family. Well, what is an idol? An idol is simply anything that activates the jealousy of God. An idol is anything that activates the jealousy of God. So what is it about your family that steals attention from God? What is it about your family that you put more attention on this, or this thing or this is a quality for us, this is something that's valuable for us, but it steals the attention from God? That thing becomes an idol, and that thing is what God wants. He always wants the idol. He always says, can I have that idol? And the moment that you give one, he's asking for another. But there's always some idols that stay alive in our hearts and in our families. There are things that we strive for, that we look for, and that we think are ideals, things that we should have. If you remember back years ago, one of the kind of ideal families on TV was the Cosby family. You guys, how many of you grew up watching the Cosby family, the Huxtables? I used to love the Cosby family, and it was such an ideal family at, at the time. And today, that's drastically changed. Now on TV, we have families like Modern Family, and it's much different than the Cosby family. And there are new issues and all kinds of things in these families that Christians look at and say, oh my gosh, that is that is not a godly family. That is not ideal. And at the same time, we've got other families like the show on TLC, 19 Kids and Counting, which supposedly is the perfect family, the ideal family. They've got tons of kids, and they're all serving the Lord. And then scandal strikes this family as well. And I just would like to say culture is not the example. Culture cannot be the standard. No matter what it looks like, especially on TV, it's like if it's on TV, you should automatically say, that's not real. This is not going to be an ideal for us. This is not something that we're going to strive for. But on the other side, you can look at reality shows and reality families, which are all jacked up in some way. But we also can have a tendency to look at those families and say, we are not like that. Thank God that we are better than that family. And reality TV has a way of making you think that you're acing this family thing. You're acing all this all the way around. My kids ain't crazy like that. We're not crazy. We've got, we've got it all kind of together. But every one of us today has somewhat of an idol that we need to allow God to remove for us. I'll tell you what ours was for Brooke and I. We always thought, you know, first marriage would be terrific. And that's, that worked out for us. We, we've only been married once, both of us. And we would do it all over again. Six, almost 16 years now. So, you know, that we thought was a victory. But we always had this idea that we were going to have our own kids. And we were going to, you know, have one kid, another kid, maybe three kids. And then maybe one day, I don't know if it just kind of worked out and somebody happened to, you know, want to get rid of a, a kid because they got pregnant out of wedlock or whatever. Then we might consider maybe adopting one day. Well, that wasn't the plan that God had for us. We hadn't been able to have kids. So for us, what we assumed, or at least in my heart, I thought that adoption and foster care was kind of second to my ideal, the thing that I kind of worshiped in my mind. I want my family to look a certain way, but God's plan was different. And now our kids are such an incredible blessing to us. And I realized that God's plan was better than the ideals and the idols of this, of this, this false family that I had imagined up. But Man, we've realized that 
that what God has is better than the plan that we would just dream up. And I'm so glad that we decided to go this way. But you know, God doesn't look for picture perfect in your family. God looks for purpose in your family. Is there a purpose for your family? Is there a purpose in your family? Are you training up children in the way of the Lord, whether they're your kids or not? Are you redeeming the marriage, if you, even if it's your second or third marriage, but all of a sudden now, you're deciding now we will live for the Lord. We are redeeming this, and from this point on, we are striving to be a godly family. The truth is, no matter what your family looks like today, you can work towards health. You can work towards health. It might not look ideal. You might not have ended up here today, this morning, with per- perfect circumstances. But God is just saying, take the idols and take the, what you thought was a perfect family. Get that out and let's start from today. Here's a fresh start. Let's remove the idols and let's work towards health today. God is a God of audibles. I don't know if you guys are football fans or not, but if you ever watch uh, football, especially the NFL, there's a lot of audibles that will happen. And one of the best quarterbacks at audibles is Peyton Manning. Now Peyton Manning will go up to the line and he will he will look at a defense and he will see certain things happening and you'll start to hear him you know, calling out things and one of the things that uh, you know he would always call out Omaha Omaha and you'd be like what does that mean and, but he would just yell at the line and he'd be pointing at people pointing out defenses and I always think like even when I'm watching TV that's the only time when a quarterback is like intimidating to me because he's like pointing at it. He's like, I see what you're up to and we're going to change everything to make sure that you don't come and get us so we can work around you. And they're pointing out. So he's calling these audibles, Omaha, Omaha, you're going to do this, you're going to do it. And everybody knows this code, but he recognizes the defense that's up against the team. And I think God does that in our life all the time. God is always aware of the defense that's coming against us. God is always aware of the attack of the enemy and how your family could fail. And God will look at moments that maybe it could be a weakness. Maybe, maybe it's not ideal. Maybe it didn't work out exactly like you thought. Maybe the relationship has been strained. Maybe with your kids it's been a lot of trouble. But God says, I'm going to call an audible. And from this point on, it may, not have, it may not have worked out perfectly to this point, but we can still win the game. And I think for us as heads of household, whether that means that you're a single mom, dad, father, husband, whatever that is, that you've got to begin to, like, like God does, you've got to begin to spot the defenses against your family and say, God, if you want to call an audible, if we're supposed to change something up here today, then we're going to do it. We're going to be in submission to you. I'm going to take the idols out of our family and get rid of all these preconceived notions that this is what the perfect family looks like. But instead, we're going to work towards from wherever we are today, we're going to work towards health. never thought that I would quote Joel Osteen, but Joel Osteen says this, that God can make greatness out of a great mess. It's true. God can make greatness out of a great mess. And no matter where your family is today, you might feel like it's been messy. You might feel like, man, I never thought we'd have to pay for this. I never thought that that there would be such pain. This is not what I dreamed of when we started our family. God can make greatness out of that. He's calling an audible today, and you can work towards health. The second thing that I believe a healthy family does is a healthy family chooses sides. Because God establishes these laws and he says, no other idols before me. And he says this, he says, not only will those families reap the, 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 sin, the sin consequences, but they will, have, they will have a thousand generations of blessing for those who put me first. So there is, a, there is a benefit to families choosing sides, choosing to say God's commands will have a place in our home. God's commands will rule in our home. There's going to be a law in our home. Because, man, you might look at this, and I've always looked at this verse and be like, man, why, why does God hold this sin against many generations? And it's true, that you're, you, you, and you know this. You, you've maybe you're still paying for the sins of your parents, of your dad, of your mom, and there's certain things, and there's, there's qualities about you, maybe positive or negative, that you reap from them. They're generational. But you know, God's blessing lasts so much longer than any curse. There might be three or four generations that have to deal with something, but God's blessing on a family lasts for thousands of generations. So establish the rule, establish the law of God in your home, and you're going to see blessings for generation. There's a story in Joshua 2, and I'm going to look at Joshua 2 in two different stories um, from two different people who responded drastically different. Israel came to Jericho, and they are about to take this city. 
So as they're about to take this city, they send spies into Jericho, and these two spies are checking things out, and they end up at a prostitute's house, which the Bible doesn't really give a lot of detail about this, but either way, they end up at this woman's house, Rahab, who is a prostitute. They end up at this woman's house, and she protects them from um, all of the the army and the warriors that are in Jericho, and she saves them, and she says this, I know that Israel is a threat to us, because wherever you go, you win, because your God is mightier than any other gods, so I want to choose your side. She says, promise me this, I will hide you, I will protect you, if you promise me and my family safety. So they hide in the in the attic or in the roof of the house. She hides them. They're able to be saved. And then after that, this is, this is exactly how she says in verse 12. I want to read this. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family. So she goes after this blessing since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live. My father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. She's asking a pretty big thing. But she goes after and she says, I see where the blessing is. I'm going after the blessing. My family is not ideal. Any kids that I have do not come out of wedlock. I'm a prostitute. I understand that from this to this point, my family is not ideal. To this point, my family does not look like the families that you have in Israel. But I see where the blessing is and I'm choosing to get my family behind that blessing. She chooses sides for her family. And as she chooses sides for her family, we see this this principle that as you choose the side of God, there's a great blessing. Whenever we took Brooklyn in uh, as a foster kid first when she was five a few years ago, uh, we began to kind of let her know about the rules of our home. And there was one day in particular, we were at the zoo, and uh, she was scared to death. She hadn't really experienced a whole lot as a kid, but we're at the zoo, and um, in New Orleans, there's an area where there's this water and rocks that you can jump on and kind of go up this hill, um, just kind of hopping from rock to rock. And so I'm doing it with her, and I'm trying to help her, and at one point, she gets scared. And she's like, I can't do this. I can't, I can't go up right there. And I stop with her, and I'm just I'm sitting right there on the side of the creek, and I say, Brooklyn, In our family, we're brave. In our family, we take chances. In our family, we help each other to do things that you never thought you could do. So I'm here with you. And you're going to be brave like Dora the Explorer, okay? And you're going to hop from rock to rock. And we're going to take out the map, the map, the map. And we're going to hop around from rock, and we're going to get up to the top of this thing. So she says, okay, daddy, I can do it. I can be brave like Dora. And I hold her hand and she begins to hop from rock to rock. And we get all the way up to the top of this creek. And she remembered that from that day on, we are not a family of quitters. We are a family that takes chances, that we try things. This is one of the many rules of our family, that we will always be brave. We will do things that don't make sense to follow God. We're going to do things that, that are going to that, that be ridiculous sometimes but we believe in each other. We're going to help each other do it. Another rule was we don't quit. We don't talk back. We use manners, all these things that we had to establish. And we constantly were saying and are still saying, this is not how we do it in this family. This is what this family does. We established rules. We chose sides. This is how we're going to do family. And Rahab chooses for her family. And I believe this, that if you don't define what matters in your family, then the things that don't matter will define your family. You've got to define what matters or what doesn't matter will define your family. You have to say today, these are the things that we care about. These are the things that matter for us. I remember growing up and going on vacation with my mom and dad. And like on Sundays, if we were on vacation, we'd go to church. Some weird little church in Arkansas. We'd be at this weird little church. And it'd be different. But I remember always we went to church on vacation. And it's something that stuck with me. Now we go on vacation to go to church. We'll be like, I really want to visit that church. Why don't we do a vacation around it? And we'll just go, we'll go somewhere to visit this cool church that we've always wanted to see or whatever, and we make it a blast. And it's just a principle that we have said and that I've learned from my family that church matters. Being there on Sunday morning matters more than playing sports on Sunday morning, more than, you know, your comfort, feeling like waking up or whatever. Being at church matters. Somebody said years ago, I mean, somebody said weeks ago that, you know, they were like, hey, you, uh, you've got to be there early on Sunday. You've got to be at church because you're the pastor. And I, I said to him after, I was like, no, I, I, I'm a pastor because I'm always, I've always been at church. Because I've not, I've, not, I've not gone to Bible college or anything like that. I don't have any formal training, but I've always had a passion for God because it was instilled in me. And because I've chose always to be in the house of God and to be around the things of God and to want to be in ministry, I believe that the Lord said I can use that. 
I can use that, and I'm going to teach you, and you're going to learn for the, your whole life what it looks like to be in a healthy ministry, to, to have a healthy church. And now I believe that the Lord has, just because of those things that we've established, those rules that church is important for us, that's why we're in ministry today. I'm, I don't dread being in, I don't dread having to come on Sunday morning. I love it. It's always been part of who I am. So you've got to establish rules for your family. And this is what happened. This is what happened in Rahab's story. I, I love this because she doesn't lose her title or her name, but she gains the blessing. So Joshua was spared. And, and after Jericho comes down, Joshua 6, 25. So Joshua was spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies. Joshua was sent to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. I look at this and I say, this woman is still, people can still look at her life and still say, she did not do it right. She didn't arrive at this place of health before she made this decision to follow God. She said that from this point, I realize that I am not, my family's not blessed, but I see something coming that I can grab the coattails of and jump on board. I see this blessing coming into town, and we're going to make a rule. I'm going to make a decision as a family that we're going to follow the things of God. And she's blessed, and her family is blessed. And it says that she lived among the Israelites. She became one of them. And she had a whole new family. Her whole, benefit, whole family benefited from the fact that she chose sides for her family. Well, she wasn't the ideal family. It wasn't perfect, but it ended up blessed. And your family, whether it's perfect or not, can end up blessed when we decide to remove the idols and get behind the blessing of God. There's another side of this story. After the walls of Jericho come down, one of the rules with Joshua said, don't take anything out of the city. Everything gets destroyed. And this man named Achan decided to do his own thing. And he decided, instead of listening, he saw the things that caught his attention, some things that would have brought wealth to him and his family, and he decided to steal instead. So as he steals this, God speaks to Joshua, and, and he, he begins to do this, this weeding out process where they choose all the families. They got, get all the families together, all the different tribes, and God begins to weed out every person who hasn't. And I'm imagining just the pressure that Achan is feeling. Achan knows that he's stolen everything, and everybody else is getting, you know, whether they draw straws or God spoke a different way, that, get, that all of a sudden the attention comes to Achan. It starts on his tribe, and then it ends up going down to his clan. It's somebody in this clan, and it goes down to his family. It's somebody in this family who's stolen from God and then all of a sudden Achan is singled out and Achan finally he finally gets down he says God oh, did I've done it I've done it I'm so sorry I'm the one who sinned I'm the one who stole everything but it was too late for him this is what it says in Joshua 7 Achan finally replies in, in verse 20 Achan replied it's true I have sinned against the Lord the God of Israel among the plunder I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. But I wanted them so much that I took them. And they are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. See, what Achan does is Achan gets his family in trouble because of his lies. And I believe that he had some actual idols, some, some wealth, some, some things that were physical that he wanted more than he wanted to obey God. There was this rule and law that was established. We don't steal from God. All of this belongs to God. And he stole and he put these idols before God. There was a lie in one man. This one man, his whole family ends up having you pay for this. I believe that number three, the healthy family is authentic. The healthy family is an authentic family. A family that realizes, hey, you, we don't actually have it all together. Maybe this was your story this morning, but I remember this being our story many mornings, growing up and coming to church. But maybe you're on your way to church and you're yelling at kids whenever you're leaving the house, come on, it's time to go! Yelling at your wife, come on, your hair looks good enough, get in the car! Everybody, come on, we're going to be late! You're yelling at each other, you're arguing, you're, you're, not, you're not jiving at all as a family. And then you get to church and you walk in the doors and the frowns go off and the smiles come on and the eyebrows go up and you're, hey, everybody, it's good to see you today. Our family's beautiful, isn't it? Look at it. Look how perfect we are. Kids check in. Love y'all. See y'all after church and you won't get it. But we have these, our families can be, unrealistic sometimes and we are ashamed to say man it just it was not a good morning today we'll never come to church not dressed 
best or dress to impress. We dress up our kids to show them off. Just all that stuff is fine. But I think in church should be the place where we can be the most real. Where we should be, where we can say, man, we are, we are not having a good day. We are not having a good week. It's been rough for us. Can you pray for us? And that's why anchor groups are so important, because those walls begin to come down. Nobody's impressed with your good looks. Nobody's impressed with how you dress. Around here, we care about authenticity. Now, when I say that, I want you to authentically be godly. I want you to authentically have the, the laws of God in your home. And I want you to chase after the things of God. That's what we try to do. And I, I hope that our authenticity is encouraging to people and they can look at us and come to our own homes and say, man, this is a godly family. This is a Christ-like family. I think more than anything, we've got to be willing to, to take down the walls and, and, and the idols of, of this is, would be ideal, so we've got to put on this show and make everybody think that everything is okay. The family is really the most authentic you'll get. You ask your husband or your wife and they'll tell you exactly how well you're doing spiritually. You ask your kids and they'll tell you exactly how godly you are. Isn't that right? Your family knows you better than anybody else. So if you're going to be authentic at all, it's got to be in your family, at home. That's, that's the thing that matters the most. It's got to begin at home. Remove the idols at home. Be authentically hungry for God at home because that's where, that's where the real you is. Everybody sees who you are at home. You've got to be real. You've got to be really chasing after the things of God. But so often we end up doing like this article that was sent to me this week about these staged Instagram photos. I'm going to show you a couple of them. And this is kind of how we end up doing life. So I've got a couple different photos. You see something like this on Instagram and you're like, man, look how cool. Look how cool, man. They've just got their MacBook and their little world and their, their, their pine cone sitting on their bed like that. And then you zoom out and you're like, oh, but this is real life. You know, this is real. And then we've got, let's go ahead and look at another one. So really cool Instagram shot, right? But kind of chaotic table. Just hurry, but get all the mess out of the way. Let's get all the stuff out of the way. We don't want anybody to see this. Let's just show this part. And this one right here is one of my favorites. <laughs> this person is not as good as yoga as they would like everybody to think. You get a little bit of help. This one right here, look how cool I am. It just so happened to be right here. Someone caught this photo. Uh, and then this one right here also at the beach. I mean, you've got all these different photos. Keep on going with them. This, one, this one's really funny. You've got this really chaotic background with this beautiful little thing. And uh, okay, so like this guy over here checking it out, he's like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, uh, obviously you're not a tennis star. I love this one. People are like, why is there a bike sitting in the middle of the road? But, but we, can, we can end up doing this. Do we have any more, Andy? That's it. I say, so we end up doing this in our life so often. How many of you have taken a photo like this? Where you're going to take a photo of your food, of somebody else, and you're like, what, hold on, can you get that out the way? Hold on, we've got to get this. I've got to get this down. I've got to make sure that the angle's right. Well, I want to get, I want to get a lens flare, so I've got to have the light right behind it. You know, you, you, we end up staging this, this real life and to, in our attempt to show how authentic we are and how, oh, look at how interesting my life is. Look at my kids. Look at, you know, I took a picture of Judah the other day, and he's sleeping. I'm trying to show how cute he is, and I'm I'm like, got to get the perfect angle, got to get down. You, you just, you, you, you make, you edit out the things that you don't want people to see so that they can assume something about you. That's what social media, that's the danger of it. But I, I just, I believe that for God and what God's heart is for our families is that we be authentic. That, hey, there might be a time when, you know, people are going to come over and you're going to have to apologize to your family after or before or, you know, in front of other people, you're going to have to say, hey, look, it's just, this is, this is us for real. This is what our family looks like for real. I have a difficult time disciplining my kids or I have a difficult time being sweet to my wife this week. It's just been a really tough, you know, there needs to be an authenticity and there needs to be a lot of apology in your family. There needs to be a lot of reconciliation in your family. That's what authenticity looks like. Joshua 7 I actually can't stand this story. I don't like this. I, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I believe there's a reason that this happened, a reason that this is in here. Joshua 7, verse 25, it says this after at the end of Achan's story. It says, Then Joshua said to Achan, Why have you brought trouble on us? So Achan, the sin of this one man, brings trouble on all of Israel. The Lord will now bring trouble on you. Then all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burn their bodies. Now, I know we live in a New Testament world, and Jesus 
has brought a new dynamic and there's not a constant, Jesus took on all of the consequence of sin and the repercussion of us doing stupid things like this so that we wouldn't have to. He took our place so that we could be in a place of royalty with him. I understand that. But there's a principle here. There's, there's something about God that you need to understand that God hates whenever deception is passed on to generations. And this guy Achan, if he had never been caught, if he had never been singled out, would have passed on deception to the next generations. And he would have passed on the idea that you can do whatever you want, you can get away with it, there's no consequence for this. But I believe that this blessing and curse law is still alive for us today. And there are, you, you look at your families and you can clearly say, there are things that my parents, their parents struggled with that I still have a pull in. There's drug and alcohol addiction, pornography addiction, different things, abuse that can, that can easily trickle down the generations. But the family that puts God first, the family that removes the idols and says, we in our generation, we will make a decision today to honor the Lord. Joshua said this in Joshua 24, verse 15 the famous statement that he makes, but he tells Israel, basically, he says, you make a decision today. What are you going to do? Are you going to go after all the idols that you used to go after? Are you going to begin to serve them again? And he names a couple idols, and he says, are you going to do that? He says, but, but listen, you have a decision to make, but as for me and my family, we will serve God. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We are making this decision, and I am making this decision as the head of my household and as an example to you that we will serve God. We will make a decision that I will not allow my laziness and the fact that I have a tendency to go towards idols. I will not allow that to rule me and thus destroy my family, have an impact in my family for generations. But instead, we make a decision today to serve the Lord so that my family will be blessed. Last final point, I guess, that I wanted to bring out is that the healthy family has a spiritual head. Like Joshua did this day, he stood up before Israel and he makes a decision for his family. This is what it's going to look like. This is what my family is going to do. This is how we are going to serve the Lord. I want everybody to see that. I would ask you this week, you've kind of got some homework now. If you're in this room and you're the spiritual head of your home, which I believe is very healthy and God would intend for that to be the man of the house, a husband, father, but some families don't look like that. You may be a single mom here today and you're the head of your home, the spiritual strength and the backbone of your family. But for every one of you that have that position, that spot where you're the spiritual head of your home, I want you to sit down with your family this week. Maybe you do it on your own if your kids are young. If you're single, take notes, do this later. But begin to look at your family, begin to look at some of the things maybe that are idols in your life. These are some things that we're not willing to give up so that we can pursue God. Maybe it's um, a certain television program. Maybe it is a lack of discipline in your home. Maybe it is this idea of this perfect family and you're lying to people around you so that you can put up this front, keep up this front. I don't know what it is for you, but this idol in your family is like, imagine a bucket with holes all over it. And as the Spirit of God, as you're trying to live your, your life and pursue the things of God, the Spirit of God is constantly pouring into your life, but there's a bucket with holes in it and you're constantly leaking everywhere and there's no strength. Your family's not able to hold any water. Now, I just would ask you this week, look at, are there some idols in my life? Are there some things in my life that we need to begin to, to plug? Some idols, some spots that we need to begin to take care of. And if you want to hold any water, you always start with the lowest one. Start with the biggest one. Start with the biggest idol. Plug the lowest hole and you begin to hold some water.